Hello, everyone, and welcome to this fireside chat hosted by the Center on Regulation and Markets at the Brookings Institution. My name is Stephanie Aronson, and I'm the Vice President and Director of the Economic Studies Program here at Brookings. This event is one of an ongoing series of fireside chats hosted by the Center, which explore important topics related to modern day markets and regulations through one-on-one -on -one conversations with regulators, business executives, and academics. Today, we are honored to be joined by John Allen, President of the Brookings Institution, and my colleague, Daryl West, the Vice President and Director of Governance Studies at Brookings. They're joining us to talk about their new book, Turning Point, Policymaking in the Era of Artificial Intelligence. Artificial intelligence is transforming our economy, society, and our politics so rapidly that it is sometimes hard to keep up. And as the authors point out, the decisions we make today about how to regula regulate AI and the policies we de develop to deal with its impact will largely determine whether AI is a force for good in our world or not. To share a little more about the authors, John Allen became the president of Brookings in November 2017, having most recently served as chair of security and strategy and a distinguished fellow in the foreign policy program at Brookings. Allen is a retired US Marine Corps four-star general and former commander of the NATO International Security Assistance Force and US forces in Afghanistan. During his nearly four decade military career, Allen served in a variety of command and staff positions in the Marine Corps and the Joint Force. Daryl West was appointed as Vice President and Director of Governance Studies in 2008, where he also holds the Douglas Dillon Chair. His current research focuses on artificial intelligence, robotics, and the future of work, and he has published multiple books with the Brookings Institution Press on these topics. Prior to coming to Brookings, Daryl was the John Hazen White Professor of Political Science and Public Policy and Director of the Taubman Center for Public Policy at Brown University. And now I'm pleased to introduce the moderator of this conversation, Sanjay Patnaik. Sanjay is the Director of the Center on Regulation and Markets and holds the Bernard L. Schwartz Chair in Economic Policy Development in Economic Studies. Before joining us last summer, Sanjay was on the faculty at the George Washington University. Sanjay deserves credit for having originated these fireside chats upon his arrival at Brookings. They arose out of his longstanding interest and in research into business and government relations, corporate political strategy, globalization, and international business. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Sanjay. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and thank you to John and Derek for being here today. Uh, it is a pleasure. Um, I would like to start with Derek. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, why you wrote the book? What inspired you to focus on that topic? Well, first of all, thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Sanjay. Uh, we appreciate your interest in AI and look forward to working with you and your team on technology issues. So we see lots of opportunities for collaboration between us. So John and I wrote this book because we think AI is the transformative technology of our time. As Stephanie mentioned, it's being deployed in many different sectors from healthcare and education to transportation, e-commerce and national defense. So in the book, we present in-depth case studies of AI in each of those areas. Uh, we look at how it's being used, what the opportunities are and what the risks are. We developed the title of Turning Point because we argue we are at a major inflection point and the crucial variable in determining our future is going to be public policy. So in the book, we present a detailed uh, policy governance blueprint. And we suggest that if we take appropriate actions, we're very confident about the future of our society. We're very optimistic about how things may unfold. But if we don't do certain things, uh, it could go off the rails very quickly. So as a society, I think our goal should be to build responsible AI that serves the public good. Great, thank you so much. Um, I would like to turn to John next. Um, you have made AI a priority area for the Brookings Institution. Can you please elaborate more on why you think it is essential for a policy-oriented think tank like Brookings to look at AI? And what is your vision for Brookings and how it can contribute to a better understanding of AI? 
Well, let me also add to Daryl the my thanks to Stephanie for her opening remarks and my thanks to you, Sanjay, for convening this conversation. Uh, and I want to thank you specifically for the work that you've done on artificial intelligence uh, across your career, but specifically since you've arrived to, as the center director. Um, as Daryl said, uh, artificial intelligence is going to be one of the uh, most transformative technologies uh, of the 21st century. When I arrived as president, it was very clear to me that, that the institution needs to acknowledge the, the potential of artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies, the potential for the change that it can create in our society going forward. Uh, and as Stephanie said, as Daryl alluded to, and I think we, we talk about it uh, pretty frequently, we, we face an environment in the 21st century with these emerging technologies um, that can either be utopia or dystopia. And of course, we won't hit either of those two extremes, but we will certainly find that uh, these technologies, which are inherently neutral, uh, will ultimately take on uh, a, per a particular uh, form uh, by whichever entity employs them or whatever country employs them. And so the point that we've attempted to make is as AI and other emerging technologies become more pervasive in the human uh, environment, uh, we have to think about the kinds of legislative or regulatory uh, considerations that are necessary with respect to policy, et cetera, in, in particular policy on how we can govern uh, these technologies. Uh, this is really important for us, uh, as I think you, you would certainly know Sanjay and others, uh, technologies in the past have been uh, often, they've often led uh, an environment uh, uh, ahead of the formulation of policy by as much as you know, seven to 10 years. And as technologies, as these technologies continue to develop, it's really important uh, for us to be thinking about what policies are going to be essential, in particular, a liberal democracy, what policies are going to be essential uh, ultimately to protect our citizenry uh, and to ensure that these technologies are uh, employed and wielded to the maximum benefit uh, of our population and our country and our allies. Um, because in the end, AI will touch virtually every aspect uh, of who we are as humans. And we'll define everything from a simple matter of uh, how our students do in classrooms. On the one end, that's not a simple matter, certainly, uh, but to the other end where it will shape geopolitics between uh, great powers. And the more we think about the policy framework for those technologies now, the better we will be prepared ultimately as these technologies become, become fielded in the world of the, the human experience. Great thing. I think that's certainly really important to kind of try to provide a framework before a lot of these technologies hit the, hit the market. Um, turning to Daryl, if you look at artificial intel intelligence, it's kind of like a buzz phrase in the popular discourse, but the meaning is often not well defined. So in, in chapter one of your book, you talk about three features of AI that help distinguish it from other technology, which is intentionality, intelligence, and adaptability. adaptability. Can you please talk through each of these features and give a few examples of AI systems that are already being widely used in different industries. Sanjay, that's a great question. And I think you're exactly right. You know, everybody has heard the term AI, but few people actually know what it means. So we do uh, open the book with a very lengthy discussion. And what we do is define AI as automated software that can analyze data, text, or images, and then make intelligent decisions based on that information. I think the key qualities are software that is intelligent, adaptable, adaptable, and has the ability to learn as it gets more information. And by that, uh, we mean that algorithms can independently analyze data and then act on the insights that come out of that. And I think the learning part is key because an algorithm should be able to improve as it gets more information. I mean, that's the whole point of AI, really. Uh, we want AI that's able to adapt to changing data as well as changing circumstances and still can make intelligent decisions uh, based on that. To give just a few examples to show the multifaceted nature of AI, uh, we're seeing applications in transportation in the form of autonomous vehicles. Uh, the AI is essential to autonomous vehicles because it's the software that integrates information from the LIDAR on top of that autonomous uh, vehicle, 
the cameras that go around the vehicle, and the remote sensors that help to keep the vehicle in the correct lane. So the autonomous vehicle is nothing without uh, AI that can instantly integrate, analyze, and assess the situation and keep people safe. In the finance area, we're seeing uh, many applications. In fact, uh, we think finance is going to be one of the leading sectors in terms of new AI applications. Uh, people are using AI for fraud detection. Mm -hmm. You can use uh, AI to uh, find outliers and abnormalities and then refer them to humans for more in-depth ins inspection to see if fraud actually has taken place. Uh, AI is being used for wealth management. It turns out that AI is more rational and less emotional than humans, uh, which turn out to be great qualities in terms of uh, managing your money. And then the last example I will give comes from the world of e-commerce and uh, the case of product recommendations, because a lot of e-commerce platforms are analyzing your online behavior, looking at your consumer purchases, and looking at the things you uh, look at on the site, but don't actually buy. And then based on uh, the analysis, that site will recommend products to you uh, that you may want before you actually realize consciously that you want them. Uh, there's some companies that have claimed that up to a third of their sales are now coming from their own product recommendations. So that's just one sign that the AI is getting better and better and it's being incorporated in commerce and trade. The last one is actually really interesting. I, I don't think a lot of people think about that when they see the recommendations pop up, that there's such a sophisticated algorithm behind it. Um, John, I'd like to turn to you. So you mentioned something really important, which, uh, which is that the technology itself is neutral, right? But it's really up to us how we use it. So if you look at AI, what are some of the most exciting opportunities that you see with AI technology? Well, Daryl's hit many of them. Um, I, I think the, uh, the opportunities are really um, limitless in many respects. Uh, medical research, for example. Uh, natural language processing has the capacity to ingest uh, decades and decades of uh, what had been basically printed reports and provide the capacity for uh, machine learning through natural language processing uh, to do an enormous amount of analysis on medical research, for example, and, and just pick a particular area. Uh, Alzheimer's, for example, uh, I think that we'll see that uh, the, the support of artificial intelligence to Alzheimer's research, research is going to make a profound difference uh, in the presence of that disease in our population in our lifetime. Uh, so medical research, uh, education, uh, artificial intelligence in the context of education of our children, uh, the, and our young adults, uh, changes the environment from one of teaching necessarily to one of learning. And when you add artificial intelligence to something um, like, uh, you know, the, 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 sim the simulated environments uh, in which we can uh, control the environment for the students uh, and have immediate feedback because of the performance of the children, uh, that gives us a capacity to have a far greater and better tailored system of education for our children through virtual reality or augmented reality. Uh, so education is, an, is uh, a, a very important area. Daryl talked about e-commerce, uh, also uh, interstate commerce with respect to driverless vehicles. So, so much of, uh, of what will touch the individual lives of, of Americans and global citizens every single day will be affected in some form or another by artificial intelligence. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm cautious that these neutral technologies in the hands of liberal democracies have the opportunity to truly uh, improve the quality of life of, uh, of the individuals uh, of our populations. But I'm also extremely attentive uh, to how illiberal states and authoritarian states and of course totalitarian states uh, can use this extremely powerful technology for the purposes of, of highly intrusive surveillance and ultimately uh, control and oppression. So it goes back to the, the utopia versus dystopia. Uh, and it's important for us to take care of ourselves, but also to be able to defend ourselves and also to understand what our potential opponents, adversaries, and even enemies uh, are doing in the wielding of these technologies. 
Actually, let me follow up on this because I think this is a really critical uh, aspect of AI. As you say, it has the potential to improve a lot of people's lives. But if we look at authoritarian regimes around the world, the AI systems are already being used for mass surveillance, for social credit scoring in China, for instance. And they have really the potential to undermine democratic societies through the proliferation of deep fake videos, of misinformation, things like that. How can we safeguard our democracies against such negative applications? Well, a regulatory environment uh, permits us to protect ourselves from ourselves in many respects. Uh, but we also have to recognize what the threats are that uh, will come at us from our opponents. You know, we live in the physical world. Uh, right now, I'm in my home in uh, Mount Vernon, Virginia. Uh, but you and I are communicating with Daryl uh, in the cyber world, in the, in the information space, if you will. And, and that uh, shapes and frames our moment-to-moment -moment existence. And when <clears throat> that environment uh, is, in fact, intruded upon by our opponents, either by distorting reality through deep fakes uh, or through, as Daryl just talked, talked about uh, through the capacity for microprocessing and microanalysis of your preferences in putting certain news items in front of you or putting uh, skewed or biased information in front of you based on whatever social platform you're on, uh, then we are vulnerable. And we have to protect ourselves again through uh, a policy regime, through regulations and uh, legislation. But we also have to defend ourselves uh, in, in, the, in the context of our military capabilities in the cyber domain. And we have just seen the president of the United States uh, level sanctions uh, on the Russians for intruding into our cyberspace and attempting to influence the opinions uh, of American citizens as it relates to the 2016 election and later. Uh, so that is a vulnerability that, uh, uh, that liberal democracies have, and we have to be conscious of that. It, it, it also requires that we educate ourselves to what uh, true information actually looks like and not find, uh, not uh, permit ourselves to fall victim uh, to the kinds of skewed information that can come over certain media platforms. And I'll let Daryl also mention or question this as well because he's got some very good thoughts on it. I think that's a really important point. Really the responsibility of each citizen also to inform themselves, right? That's correct, exactly right. Turning to Daryl, like these are some of the risks that we that we heard about, right? About AI, looking at our democracy and cyber intrusions. What are some of the other biggest risks that you see with AI technology going forward? I certainly agree with all the worries John just expressed in terms of uh, the uh, use of AI by authoritarian governments to uh, suppress their uh, people, uh, the risk of misinformation, the risk of uh, disinformation. But within the domestic uh, space, there are some additional concerns related to fairness and bias. And certainly my colleague, Nicole Turner Lee, has uh, written extensively on these issues. Uh, so, for example, financial institutions are making decisions on loans and mortgages based on AI applications. And so the question is, are those algorithms operating in a fair manner? Are they equitable? Are there inequities related to race, uh, gender, or marital status? In the bricks and mortar world, we have clear rules on what banks can consider and what they are not allowed to consider. We need to make sure that the algorithms operate in a fair and unbiased uh, manner. Uh, lack of transparency is a big problem in the AI area. You know, we uh, refer to this as the, the black box. Like nobody really understands how those algorithms operate. How do they make decisions? What are the data uh, that they incorporate in their uh, decisions? Uh, as AI becomes more pre prevalent in education, healthcare, finance, and other areas, we need greater transparency about how they are making those decisions so that we can then assess their fairness, uh, their uh, bias, and their impact on humans. Uh, the impact on human safety uh, clearly is a big uh, consideration. Uh, as autonomous vehicles start to come online, uh, this is becoming a big issue. Uh, this week, uh, we actually just had a tes Tesla crash uh, where uh, the car is being operated uh, via autopilot uh, that crashed. Uh, and so uh, questions of uh, safety are going to be uh, paramount. And then the last thing I'll mention is a basic governance question of who decides. The old model in the technology area was what we love to refer to as permissionless innovation, whereby we essentially let 
private companies make the decisions. They would decide what the new products would be, how to innovate, uh, how these products got deployed, to whom they were sold, et cetera, et cetera. People are now no longer comfortable with that approach. Uh, they want more public engagement, more public involvement, more public oversight. Uh, we can do this through policies, laws, uh, regulations, and or ethical standards. Uh, there is a growing tech lash out there, kind of a backlash against the technology sector. And uh, that is likely to move the public as well as policymakers in the direction of stronger enforcement and tougher policies. Yeah, I think that the last point is really interesting because I think the market power of these companies just has so, grown so much over the last couple of years that a lot of people are concerned about it. And I think the transparency issue is really highlighting a, a vulnerability of our regulatory system because oftentimes the regulators don't even understand uh, what the AI systems do and, and the black box of these algorithms. And it's very difficult to design policies if you don't really understand the technology. And I think that's just going to get worse. So we have to find new ways to regulate. Um, and that's actually, John, that's my next question for you. So you talk to policymakers on a regular basis, right? And so what has been the response by the policymaker community to your book um, and issues regarding AI? Are policymakers thinking about it? Do they take it seriously in DC or at the state level? Oh, yes, they're taking it very seriously, Sanjay, um, because it gets back to the, uh, the heart of the issue in many ways. And let me just use an acronym that we hear frequently. We hear it in the private sector. We hear it amongst the policy uh, participants. And it's, the acronym is LC, E-L-S, all of them capitalized, little i. Uh, and in the liberal democracy, in the, in the U.S. democracy, more and more, uh, the private sector in harmony with the, the policy environment uh, uses this acronym as, as a guide. And it's a very in-depth guide in, in, the long, in the big scheme of things, but in the very, at the most basic level, the E stands for what are the ethical implications of this particular application of artificial intelligence? The L is what are the legal implications? Uh, and Daryl just mentioned the crash that occurred uh, with the Tesla vehicle. There, there will be substantial uh, legal analysis of how that happened and the outcomes. Uh, in terms of jurisdictions and uh, uh, traffic regulations, et cetera, et cetera. So the ethical, the legal, and then the S is for the societal implications of a particular application. And the, the little I is for implications. So I think that we in, in this country and more broadly in the community of democracies are far more attuned now uh, to the implications of artificial intelligence uh, in the day-to-day -day lives of our citizens, uh, where 10 years ago, uh, by virtue of the strength of computing and the availability of big data analytics, AI was a notion, but AI wasn't nearly as pervasive. Today, uh, with the uh, improvement in the capacity for supercomputing, with the availability, uh, increased availability of big data and the sophistication of, uh, of algorithms, this is far greater a concern as we go forward. And so I think that we, uh, this book is of great interest. I've heard a number of folks, uh, not trying to pat Daryl on the back since he did so much work on it, but I should. Um, there are so many folks who said, I, I truly now understand by reading this book that artificial intelligence left unto itself uh, is a potential problem. So we need to have a regulatory environment uh, or a policy environment that helps to shape how these applications actually benefit humankind. And, and let me just make, uh, read one thing to you. You know, Daryl and I uh, wanted to make sure that we were very clear that artificial intelligence we see as an asset and emerging technologies uh, are, are on the horizon to the good of all humankind. So when we dedicated this book, uh, we dedicated it as follows. This book is dedicated to our youth into whose hands we place the full potential of artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies. It is our most fervent prayer that they are guided by the light of good in wielding these technologies for the benefit of all humanity. Uh, being able to wield these technologies to the good and the benefit of all humanity will come not just from the technologies themselves, but our capacity to shape their employment and their application through laws and regulations and policies to ensure that those technologies are in fact applied uh, to the good and the benefit of all humanity. 
And I think that that would be critical also in terms of the acceptance of these technologies by the population, right? If we look at autonomous vehicles, for instance. Um, and that actually brings me to my next question for Daryl. If we look at the US government currently, do you think the US government is prepared to adequately regulate AI? And what kind of uh, federal agencies do you think should regulate AI? Should it be one agency? Um, and what kind of improvement or changes should uh, agencies make in order to have that capacity? Well, the short answer to your first question is no. Uh, <laughs> most government agencies are not uh, well equipped to regulate AI at this point. Uh, they have big problems in terms of lack of proper staffing and lack of proper expertise uh, to uh, regulate AI. Uh, industry obviously can pay far higher salaries. I mean, good AI people can earn a million dollars a year uh, from the uh, private sector. So it does make it very uh, challenging for the federal government uh, to get uh, qualified people who understand AI, understand uh, the way that it operates, uh, can uh, uh, develop data that uh, uh, illustrates uh, some of the uh, risks and some of the harms, and then develop regulations that can uh, deal with those issues. It's really hard for the government to uh, compete for uh, technology talent and build the staffing re uh, required for effective uh, regulation. On the structural issue, I think there are interesting questions in terms of how the federal government approaches uh, the topic of AI regulation. I think in the short run, what we have now and what we're likely to retain, at least in the immediate future, is a sector-based approach to regulation, where the Department of Transportation regulates AI in autonomous vehicles, the Federal Trade Commission handles consumer harms, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission handles employment-related uh, problems of AI. The Department of Education handles education-related AI. And the Department of Health and Human Services addresses health IT uh, issues. Uh, that's the status quo and uh, probably will continue to be the case uh, for a number of years. But that approach is problematic because there are some AI issues that cut across sectors. Uh, clearly, the privacy uh, topic is an issue, whether you're talking about health, education, uh, transportation, uh, employment, or uh, basic uh, consumer uh, finance. Uh, so, uh, you know, we need a national privacy law that really protects people regardless of where the particular application uh, is. On the issue of whether we need a new agency, my colleague Tom Wheeler has proposed the creation of what he calls a digital regulatory agency, which would handle these cross-cutting issues and develop a well-trained staff that can regulate AI regardless of the particular sector. And so that's something that we're actively uh, debating and trying to determine, you know, do we need that? What would it look like? How would it operate? And uh, so on. But, you know, that approach is likely to take uh, 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 several years to uh, stand up, especially in our current uh, political climate with a 50-50 set. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think, one point is, is quite important that you mentioned. If, if it is sectorally based, I think it would be very difficult for the government to get the capacity and the skill level if it's distributed across the different agencies, right? Um, so if you look at AI governance, what should be the highest priority for policymakers right now if they look at it to improve AI governance? And in your book, you mentioned um, as a suggestion, improving governance through distributed collaboration. Can you explain a little bit what that means? I mean, what we suggest in the book is that in addition to needing technology innovation, we need governance innovation. Mm -hmm. We need new models of how we think about developing guardrails that will promote human values and protect humans from some of the safety risks, the fairness and bias questions, and the lack of uh, transparency. So we need some approach to regulation that encourages innovation because that is going to be a big driver of our economy and international uh, commerce while mitigating the clear consumer harms that we want to uh, guard against. So in the book, as you mentioned, we discussed the notion uh, that we call distributed collaboration is one way to think about that. Uh, that involves providing uh, vehicles for experts in government and industry to come together to develop effective guardrails. Now, this can take place through the use of technical standards. Uh, that actually has been a common way to handle technical issues in the past. So, for example, when we were developing mobile technology, there were different companies that had different approaches to handling uh, cellular communications. 
And so what the government did was bring the experts together, develop standards for cell phones to be able to communicate with one another, regardless of the company that was involved, make sure that uh, the communications took place in a safe and reliable manner, and that all the products were built based on those standards. So that is one way to kind of think about dealing with some of these uh, issues. Uh, NIST, which is the National Institute for Standards and Technology, is a current federal agency that is working very hard in this area. It's been tasked by uh, Congress to uh, develop uh, standards for AI that can mitigate uh, some of these issues. Uh, we've been involved in uh, some of their uh, discussions where they uh, brought people together. They've been having meetings and uh, workshops uh, that try and bring together uh, the expertise of people involved in government, business, and academia to figure out what are the best ways to improve privacy. Uh, to make sure uh, we have secure uh, products and services. How do we guarantee human safety uh, with these uh, new AI applications? So those are just uh, a few ways, and the book goes into greater details on these things, uh, but government agencies need to modernize their processes and update the way they think about regulation itself. I think you bring up a really important point, which is that if we look historically at the, at the two words, let's say Silicon Valley with the developments in technology, and then the policymaking community here in DC, I think those two words have historically been quite separate. And I think for AI, we really need to have a much better open communication between these two worlds. Let me, um, let me, come, yeah, come in behind that, Sanjay, because you make an important point, and, and Daryl and I have made this point publicly, and it's in the book. And that is for many years until we began to see uh, active engagement by policymakers and, uh, and the regulatory considerations. Uh, many of the, the regulations associated with the application of artificial intelligence were baked into the code far upstream. They were baked into the code in Silicon Valley. Uh, and the, the policymakers in Washington really had no idea what the, uh, the implications were of a particular algorithm, uh, either for good or bad. Uh, and one of the purposes of this book was, in fact, to help to educate policymakers uh, that these algorithms and the code associated with uh, the, the expected outcomes uh, can't be left solely in the hands of those who are code writers. <clears throat> this has to be uh, an effort where government is involved. Government is involved to the extent that the regulatory process, the policy uh, that the policies that are formulated, uh, in, enhance innovation and improve the quality of human life, but don't at the same time, don't strangle innovation. And that's a really important and very delicate balance. Uh, and this is where, this is why government has got to be involved in this to understand that we have a lot to do on innovation, but we can strangle that if we're not careful uh, with the wrong kinds of policy or regulatory environment. And I think that's a very difficult balance to strike for regulators. How, how to make sure that we have that innovation without strangling it, but safeguarding uh, the customers at the same time. Um, I want to turn to John, uh, to, to, to you, to, to an area that is obviously very closely related to your longstanding career in the U.S. military, which is um, how AI relates to warfare. In your book, you mentioned the concept of hyperwar, where human decision making is almost entirely removed from time sensitive military actions. So can you please talk a little bit about this issue in more detail? And especially what I'm wondering is, should we actually remove human decision-making completely from military actions at all? And how can we safeguard against AI systems making the wrong decisions? I just read recently that the Russians are now thinking of embedding fully autonomous AI systems in their tank units, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Sure. Well, I don't advocate uh, removing the human from the uh, environment. In fact, there's a, you know, a very vigorous debate going on in the liberal democracies and in the United States as well on where is the human in this process? We call it, where is the human in the loop? Or where is the human on the loop? And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, from time immemorial, the side that can apply military force with greater precision and with greater velocity is typically the side that will win. It doesn't make any difference whether we're in chariots, uh, tanks, or the, the future systems that we may well see that uh, rely on artificial intelligence and uh, hyper velocity. But the, those two truisms are at work no matter what the systems are. And that is the side that can move more quickly with greater precision is the side that will frequently and usually prevail. Um, and if you look at the relationship, the Clausewitzian relationship of technology to the human over time, we talk about the character of war, which is the technical, the technological dimension of war, the equipment. 
And we talk about the nature of war, the, the human involvement in the process. And humans being what they are, humans have typically remained largely the same and unchanged as it in, in the involvement in this business of conflict and war. But the technology of war, the character of war has changed dramatically. And if I were to graph this out, so we had the y-axis as the vertical and the x-axis as the horizontal, and uh, the x-axis is, is time, and the y-axis is the improvement or the increase of technology over time, for much of human history, the line of technology was, was virtually parallel and almost uh, asymptotic, uh, asymptotic to uh, the, the x-axis. There was very little change. There was very little improvement. Uh, in uh, the nature of the technology of war. But in the aftermath of uh, the Second World War and the advent of computing, and as we began to see computing become stronger, and as command and control systems became more comprehensive, we began to see this, this line began to lift up off the x-axis. And today, the, the technology is not just changing, Sanjay. The rate of change of technology is nearly mind-boggling. Mm. Uh, and so we have a, a real dilemma today where uh, we have technology that is changing, but the human in many respects is the same individual that was involved uh, throughout uh, the entire history of warfare. So the challenge that we face is not just that we have changing technologies, and in many respects, those technologies rely on artificial intelligence. The challenge that we face is how do we equip the human uh, to be part of this process? And, and so the idea of hyperwar isn't just about artificial intelligence. The idea of hyperwar is that artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies both hasten the capacity to wage war um, and give us greater precision in ways we have never imagined before. Mm. And so as we think about that, what that means is we're starting to move far faster than we ever have before. Uh, and as we think about how fast our opponents might be moving, the question for us, the difficult question for us is where is going to be the human in the loop? Because I think we know that Russians are, are not going to be constrained to put a human in the loop with fully autonomous battlefield systems. And right now we are not producing fully autonomous battlefield systems because we wanna have a, a human in the loop. Uh, but if a human is in the loop, inherently it slows the process slightly. Yeah. So when you're competing against an opponent uh, who is employing fully autonomous lethal systems in the battle space, whether they're uh, uh, swarms of drones that have computer vision and facial recognition that can take out key individuals at a headquarters uh, or a, an attack of drones like that that might come at a sporting event where with, again with computer vision and facial recognition individuals, VIPs, et cetera, might be taken out. We, when, we have, when we're competing against uh, opponents like those, we have a real challenge. And so we're, we're dealing uh, in our own conversation about where the human should be in the loop uh, and whether we should ever produce a fully autonomous uh, lethal weapon system and release it into the battle space. For now, we are not. We are not. Um, but we have to face the reality that our opponents will not feel so constrained as we are on humanitarian on a humanitarian basis. There's a lot more I could say about this, but let me just make this other point. There's a lot of AI, though, that is being applied in the military. Mm. Uh, AI that Im improves our capacity uh, for intelligence collection and intelligence analysis, and does it in a way that produces uh, analysis so much faster than it did when you had rooms full of analysts looking at computers, or, uh, computer screens or, or uh, imagery, and, and provides that information far more quickly to decision makers. Uh, we have uh, artificial intelligence being applied to maintenance, uh, where uh, AI, the capacity for algorithms in certain systems with the uh, substantial dynamic components in those systems, can, de can detect the earliest anomaly in the operations of those systems so that we can affect maintenance far earlier in a process to, to prevent the catastrophic failure of dynamic systems. That means that we're more efficient. That means we're safer. That means we're more effective. Our systems will be up and operating longer because the kinds of maintenance that we can do gets out ahead of the potential for catastrophic failure of dynamic systems. And then there's uh, artificial intelligence on 
uh, wearable systems so that we have a, a very good feel for this, the state of the health of the individuals uh, within a particular unit that may be engaged in combat, to include being able to track them to see who's wounded uh, mm -hmm. or who's uh, experiencing uh, enormous uh, duress, uh, being able to track uh, those who may have been wounded or killed in combat so that we know if, uh, if we need to surge a certain kind of medical capability forward uh, because of the nature of the wounds or push forward certain kinds of people to, as replacements. So there are, there are real uh, applications for artificial intelligence in, uh, in our military forces um, that don't require us to have to debate the lethal dimension of this. And I'll make one final point. Yeah. Uh, and that is, it's one that we were very attentive to uh, in the, the US and amongst our allies. And that is artificial intelligence uh, and its presence in nuclear command and control. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, I would suggest you see the movie Failsafe, which is, uh, a, in essence, a futuristic movie uh, that talked about an artificially intelligent system that ultimately would govern, uh, with the presence of a human in the loop, an artificially intelligent system that would govern uh, American nuclear command and control, and it fails. Uh, and so the whole issue associated with how uh, and where the human is in nuclear command and control is something we have to keep a very close eye on. And this is an area where we should be talking to the Chinese and the Russians constantly uh, to ensure that uh, we're very clear uh, about uh, the fact that we will probably never put uh, artificial intelligence in nuclear command and control systems. Uh, but if we ever saw it going in the other side, it's going to create a real decision dilemma for us. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a pretty terrifying thought if you think about it, right? Yeah. I want to follow up on that, right? So you said um, that obviously other countries don't have the same uh, problems with fully autonomous systems and they're developing the Russians and the Chinese. So how should the West and how should the US with its allies respond to that? Where, is there a way to kind of like um, neutralize that threat without going the same way? Well, we should be talking to them right now. And, and in truth, you know, we can't go into a lot of detail here, but in truth, we are having these conversations now. Okay. And uh, I think with at least one of the great powers out there, there, there is no desire for us to engage in an artificial intelligence arms race, if you will. Okay, that's good. Uh, in the 20th century, of course, the Cold War was defined in many respects by a thermonuclear arms race. And it, it was the, the basis in many respects uh, for the uh, the competition that we saw during, during the Cold War. Uh, those days are over, uh, but we could easily see that artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, biotechnologies, uh, all supported by uh, supercomputing, quantum computing as time goes on, we could see uh, an AI arms race, uh, which could be quite destructive, quite disruptive uh, in the big scheme of things. And before uh, all the relevant sides who are sufficient, sufficiently sophisticated technologically, before all of these sides begin to build major weapon systems, hypersonic systems that are artificially intelligent that can fly for days or even weeks at a time before it decides to ultimately and unilaterally target a particular location, we need to start to have the conversations about how we can, as we have done with other weapon systems, yeah. determine that we will limit the, uh, the production of those systems the location of those systems, or even if we ever do produce them, um, geofencing, uh, putting certain targets completely off limit to autonomous systems, et cetera. I mean, there's a lot that we have to talk about now. This is the time to have the conversation because uh, even though the, the Russians intend to have autonomous uh, armored systems in the battle space, it's still pretty early in all of our country's uh, production of these systems. Now's the time to have these conversations about disciplining ourselves as a community of nations, even though we don't agree yeah. uh, they're authoritarian or totalitarian, even though we don't agree with the system of government, we can certainly agree that we don't want the outcome. Definitely. Uh, and here we should be talking and we should be talking uh, very aggressively. And Daryl and I have written about this. Yeah, I mean, it's in no one's interest to go out that arms race, right? Exactly. Um, Darren, I want to change gears a little bit. And so if we look at our allies, especially the European Union, we see that they have been thinking about AI policy governance and regulation for quite some time. And they actually just came out with uh, plans, with quite detailed plans to strictly regulate AI systems, including banning AI for mass surveillance, for social credit systems like it's being used in China. 
And so I think that that sets quite important standards for Western democracies. Do you think that the US should follow with similar regulations and coordinate with the EU in coming up with a, a governance framework or is the US going its own way? I mean, I think we do need to coordinate with the European Union on the future of AI. And you mentioned the new uh, uh, guidelines that they've just uh, come out uh, with. And I would really encourage people to take a close look at them because it's a very important step uh, forward in terms of how we can approach AI, uh, what the policy should be and what the nature of the regulation should be. And what I find interesting about the EU approach is it adopts what it calls a risk-based approach to AI, meaning that the regulations are geared to the degree of risk, with risk defined as the number of consumers affected, uh, the size of the company, uh, the scope of the impact, like does it affect uh, human uh, safety? That requires a very high level of regulation. Uh, the EU designates law enforcement and criminal justice as a high risk area just because it can lead to the arrest or incarceration of uh, individuals. In fact, in the United States, there actually are some uh, cities and some uh, law enforcement agencies that are using predictive analytics to target particular neighborhoods as high crime areas, uh, transfer resources uh, to those areas. But of course, all of those predictive analytics are based on historic data that are completely biased uh, 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 based on uh, race. And so the predictions are uh, biased uh, in a uh, racial uh, direction. So I think that risk-based approach is a good way to think about it. And some of their uh, particular recommendations, for example, they're uh, banning the use of facial recognition software until the systems become more accurate. Uh, there actually are a few American localities uh, that uh, have taken that step as well, particularly in terms of uh, use of facial recognition by uh, law enforcement. Uh, the EU guidelines uh, propose fines for companies that violate uh, their rules, uh, that the fines can go up to 6% of global sales. So uh, basically those could lead to very stiff fines if your company uh, violates uh, the guidelines uh, that have been uh, put into place. The guidelines pick up on a recommendation that we make in our book uh, that came out uh, last year, uh, they call for risk assessment. In our book, we called for AI impact statements, kind of uh, uh, that uh, parallel uh, the concept of an environmental uh, uh, impact uh, statement. So they suggest that companies need to undertake risk assessment of their AI applications, and they need to provide what they call proof of safety uh, of those AI applications. Although the one thing I don't understand, and I would like to have uh, much greater clarity about uh, what our uh, European uh, uh, colleagues have in mind is, what does that mean in practice? Uh, like how do companies actually provide proof of safety of an AI application? So I think uh, we need uh, more uh, details to uh, assess that. And then a final recommendation they make is that companies have to explain how their AI operates. So basically they want uh, much greater transparency in uh, the use and application and the operational aspects of AI. So whether the US should move in all those directions, uh, I think you know we have to kind of wait and see, but I think uh, given the challenges that John mentioned in regard to China and uh, Russia, uh, Russia on the international sphere, it's very important for the uh, US and the European Union to stay together, that we uh, kind of think about what our shared uh, interests are in confronting authoritarian uh, nations and to make sure that our AI regulations are coordinated in particular ways. Let me come in as well, Sanjay. And I, I was recently asked a question uh, along these lines uh, about whether there is a, a quadrangle, if you will, uh, Russia and China as two of the points and the United States and the EU uh, as the other two points. And to Daryl's comment, look, the, the Euro-Atlantic region, North America uh, and Europe uh, share so much in the context of our common values and our common interests and our common systems of government and our common, common systems of, uh, of, of our economies and, our, and how we value our, the individuals within our populations. We share so much. And for us to find ourselves at odds on these kinds of things, uh, these kinds of uh, regulatory standards, we should look very, very carefully uh, at why those differences occur and try to find ways 
where we can come closer together. Now we'll, we will always, countries always act in their own self-interest. So we will never be in 100% coincidence necessarily with the, with the European Union. Uh, but I would propose that we should work very hard if the proposition that there is a quadrangle out there on issues associated with the application of these technologies, we ought to work very hard to turn that into a triangle uh, so that the United States uh, and the EU uh, are almost imperceptibly different uh, in our commitment to human rights, our commitment to the rights of our citizens, and the, the uh, fair, explainable, safe applications of these technologies. Uh, I totally agree. I think it would really increase the leverage that we have, even on the rest of the world that is maybe in between the superpowers. Um, I want to talk a little bit about another aspect that actually came up in an audience question here, which is the impact of AI on the labor markets, right? I think we have two potential effects. One is that uh, a lot of um, um, tasks might get much more efficient and we can actually improve our decision-making and improve the workflow in this area, for instance, the medical field. But on the other hand, a lot of people are worried about um, the impact on low-skilled workers or even high, some high-skilled workers in the end in terms of unemployment. And I'm curious, what are your thoughts on this to both of you? Kind of like what trends do we see so far? What kind of policies can we put in place to mitigate some of those impacts? I mean, I would say that AI has the potential both to take jobs as well as create new kinds of jobs. We're already seeing AI starting to replace jobs in the finance uh, sector, you know, the examples I gave before in terms of fraud detection and wealth management, uh, there are going to be accountants who lose their jobs because AI can add up the numbers uh, as well as, if not better, than uh, human uh, beings. In the retail sector, uh, we're seeing fully automated retail stores operate. I actually visited one in Seattle and basically you go in, you go shopping, uh, the company uses computer vision and AI applications uh, tied to your credit card or your mobile payment system. Uh, you walk out, it automatically charges your account. No sales clerks, uh, no uh, cash registers. So there certainly are going to be uh, entry level jobs are at risk, but there are going to be new types of jobs that are created, certainly data analytics. Any young person out there who wants a guaranteed uh, future, uh, learn data skills. Uh, because we need uh, data scientists, uh, we need people who are uh, skilled at analyzing uh, large uh, data sets. I think the greatest risk is uh, what I would call a skills mismatch, where people don't have the skills for the new jobs that are going to be created. And in the book, we talk a lot about workforce development, job retraining, and lifelong learning, kind of the old education model where people invest in, edu in education up through about age 25 is going to be obsolete. People mm -hmm. are gonna to have to upgrade their job skills at age 30, 40, 50, and 60, literally uh, throughout their uh, lifetime. So uh, companies are starting to develop job retraining programs for their employees, and they certainly uh, need to do uh, that and, and do even more of that. Uh, universities need to move into adult education. That is going to be a big uh, growth market. Community colleges already are doing a good job, but the four-year uh, schools uh, need to do uh, more of that as well. And from a public policy standpoint, we need to think about the question, who's going to pay for this lifelong learning? Uh, like there are young people coming out of college with 50, 60, or $70,000 in higher education debt. Uh, when I tell them uh, you need to engage in lifelong learning, uh, they tell me you're crazy. Like you expect me to keep paying for uh, advanced uh, uh, training even beyond the age of 25. And so there's a public policy question in terms of uh, that important issue, who is gonna pay for lifelong learning? And I'll come in behind uh, Daryl and he makes some very important points. You know, with other, uh, the other prior industrial revolutions, often advances in technology did not have uh, with them the, uh, the coordinated uh, efforts to be taken, the coordinated measures that would be taken by society uh, to deal with the displacement of those that would in fact lose their jobs because of enhanced technologies. And so what we saw was uh, often some fairly uh, substantial and widespread societal disruption uh, as uh, the societies in the prior industrial revolutions or at any point in the march of technology uh, embraced and adopted and applied these technologies. And there was widespread, large-scale uh, disruption and unemployment. Look, we, this is a fourth industrial revolution and we can see this coming. And Daryl has just laid out some really important uh, obligations that we have going back to ELSI. If we see these technologies coming and if we see that there will be some fundamental changes 
uh, in the, the scope of work or the kinds of work that'll be necessary ultimately uh, to fully embrace a digital horizon as, as it's coming towards us, then we have an obligation, goes back to this issue of the, uh, the character versus the nature of our society. We have an obligation as we embrace a more sophisticated character to our society to do all we can to ensure that we buoy the nature of our society at the same time. And that's job skills, it's vocational training, it's a commitment by the society to enhance uh, lifelong learning. Yeah, I think the lifelong learning is a really interesting aspect. And I think that we'll even go throughout all different uh, levels of education and not only for low-skilled workers. And that will really require different ways of, of approaching education and different ways of organizing our workforce. So this is, this is a great point. Um, I want to um, finish with a, a two final questions for, you know, for both of you. Maybe John, we can start with you first. Um, if you could name one aspect of AI that you're most excited and positive about, which one would it be? And one aspect that you're most concerned about? I think I'm most positive about how AI will change the way we both educate our children. Uh, well, the, 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 the outcome of education. I'm very excited about where AI can take education as we go forward. Uh, it, it will have the, the benefit of not only preparing us for this digital horizon that we're facing, but also the, the capacity to enhance the, the innovation in a rolling capacity as we go on. So I'm very excited about uh, how education can be enhanced using artificial intelligence as we go forward. And of course, uh, we've talked about it in a number of ways, and that is uh, in, a, in the context of uh, the concerns I have, and that is uh, the concerns for the privacy and the rights of our individual citizens. Uh, and that's not just uh, as a result of uh, the reaching of uh, the Russians or, the, or other malefactors, the Chinese, into our cyberspace and information space and attempting to change the way our people think or act. Uh, it's, it's how we do it to ourselves. Yeah. And so I, we have to be constantly vigilant, constantly vigilant to the rights of our citizens to ensure that uh, either inadvertently or uh, intentionally, uh, we are not employing these technologies to the detriment of our population. And we need to defend ourselves from our uh, opponents and enemies from that as well. So that's my biggest concern. And I think you bring up an important point that oftentimes a lot of the privacy violations actually come from private companies or companies in the United States, right? That That's don't right. take our data. So we don't have the policy framework for that. That's right. Now, I, I'm obviously concerned about the artificially intelligent, hyper uh, capable uh, nuclear weapons. I'm very concerned about that. Yeah, I think uh, everyone should be. <laughs> but, but that's a ways off still, and we're going to have the conversation. But the, the moment to moment existence of the American citizen or the citizen, you pick the country of, a, of democracy or in any other state. Uh, I worry about the, the human rights of that citizen, the privacy of that citizen, and ultimately the quality of life being enhanced by artificial intelligence rather than degraded or oppressed by artificial intelligence. Definitely. What about you, Darren? Same questions. I think what I'm most excited about is the potential for various kinds of new technologies to free humans from boring, dirty, or dangerous jobs. And I think we're actually close to that. Uh, technology is advancing in all sorts of uh, ways, and it may be that some of the worst jobs, in the sense of being boring and dirty and dangerous, we actually can automate. And what that could do, if they are accompanied by appropriate public policy changes, right. is to free people for more creative activities. Like, yeah. I know lots of people who are interested in the theater, the arts and crafts, uh, music, uh, they have hobbies on the side. Uh, they're interested in sports. Uh, there are all sorts of things that people like to do other than their job. It may be that we are able to end up in the best of uh, both possible worlds in the sense of not having, uh, you know, being relieved from the tedious uh, jobs and being saved for more uh, creative uh, activities. So uh, I'm excited about the possibility of being able to move in that direction. I think the thing I'm most concerned about is the loss of human agency. Like when I give talks either in the United States or around the world, what people are really worried about is the loss of human control over technology. Like, you know, they've seen all of the, the Hollywood movies, the Terminator, <laughs> and it's basically 
hyper intelligent AI driven uh, super beings that ultimately enslave uh, humanity and that we're no longer in charge. People are really worried about that. And a lot of the concerns about privacy, uh, security, uh, uh, human safety, and so on, basically come out of this broader worry about loss of human control. So uh, what I like to tell people, and, and John and I make this point very clearly in the book, it's actually an optimistic book in a number of different senses, humans are still in charge in the sense that we control the policies, the laws, the regulations, and the ethical standards that, if appropriately implemented, can move technology in the direction of human values, protect human safety, and move the technology in a way that it conforms to human values and that people are in charge and not the technology itself. I think that's a really important point, and, and I, can, I can totally see why people are concerned about that. Well, we're at the end of our chat, uh, 3.30. I really want to thank both of you. This has been super interesting. I appreciate your time. I know both of you are very busy, so thank you very much. Honored to be with you, Sanjay. Thank you for all you're doing. Daryl, thank you. It's wonderful to see you again. Thank you, John. Good day. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.